Good morning. This morning's reading is from Jonah chapter 2. Jonah's prayer. From the inside, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again towards the holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, and the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. The roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Hi. Um, When Caleb and I were married, in our first few years of marriage, we lived in England, and we worked in this really great church called St. Matthew's, and um, it was the summer holidays in the UK, uh, so we had a big chunk of time off, and Caleb and I came back to New Zealand to visit my family for um, a number of weeks. And these beautiful parishioners who were really affirming and encouraging of our ministry gave us an envelope before we got on the plane, and it was a check for Caleb and I to go and have a night away somewhere while we were back in New Zealand. So we went on the internet and found this really lovely place that was about half an hour north of Auckland. Um, Mum and Dad were living in Auckland at the time. So we scooted off one night to have this night away at a bed and breakfast. And it was in this beautiful home. um, And it was in like this valley. uh, It was surrounded by beautiful native bush. And we were driving and we kept missing the turn off. We were a little bit lost. And finally we found it. We turned off. We drove down the beautiful driveway that was leading up to this majestic home. And um, as we came in, there were no other cars. So it was just us at this B&B this night. And we, we get our bag out of the car. We go knock on the door and we're greeted by this couple and they welcome us in. There's a roaring fire in the kind of entranceway and these beautiful, like expensive looking leather couches. You know the ones I mean? We go in and this couple offer us a cup of tea. So we sit down and we have our lovely cup of tea in a fine bone china cup. And we're talking just about stuff. And then they ask us, so what is it that you both do? And we said, oh, we're training to be Anglican priests. And their faces went very serious. And I tell you, like, they didn't really talk to us from that point. They were like really awkward around us and quite like just quite standoffish. So we finished our cup of tea and we awkwardly like they got their um, cleaner person to take us up to our room. And it was just like this really weird vibe all of a sudden. But anyway, so we, I can remember we walk up the staircase and they open the door. The lady opens the door to our room and it is beautiful. It is a really fresh space, like the, um, the bed's got like a really crisp white duvet and it like, looks like it's really plush, feathery duvet and there's beautiful cushions and at the end of our bed are these really fluffy white towels and robes and little slippers for us to have and the curtains are a beautiful print and it smells like they've got a really expensive air freshener in the space like they've come in and just like sprayed it you know and the carpet's really like when you stand on it, it's like really fluffy and white and beautiful it was a beautiful space so anyway we um unload our things and we decide that we're going to go out and have a meal in the local town 
and then we'll come back for the evening and watch a movie. So we go out, we have our dinner, we decide that we're going to buy some nice wine and cheeses to have, and we pick them up, we head back to the B&B, we quickly run in through the front door and up our room so we don't have to have another awkward moment with the owners. Um, and there's no couch in the room, so we have to set up the bed as like our couch to watch this movie. So we get the laptop out and Caleb pours the wine and we set, there's no like plates or cutlery in the room, so we have to make a little like platter out of the cardboard box that the crackers were in to put our little cheese and crackers on. We set it all up, we're sitting in the bed ready to hit play and I say, Caleb, it's kind of cold in here, could you turn the heater on? And he says, yeah, sure. And he's just sitting there holding his glass of wine. He, st- he stands up and the tiniest little movement of that flipping glass of red wine, the littlest bit comes out. And do you know what? Do you know what happens when a glass of red wine gets knocked? What comes out? Red wine. The red wine, it was honestly the littlest knock, and it went and like flung, I can, I can see it, like flung across the room. There were speckles of red wine all over this white duvet cover, and you could see that it had seeped through into the feather duvet. And there were scattering, splatterings of this red wine on the beautiful cream carpet. And this couple's downstairs that doesn't like the fact that there are Anglican priests in their b and B. I I learned this technique once, another time that I spilt red wine on white carpet, is that you pour, now take this one into, into account because it's really good. You pour heaps and heaps of water all over the wine. You don't dab it in. You pour heaps of water over it, and then you just place a towel on top, and it seeps up. And that's great when you've got heaps of towels that aren't white. We only had two towels. And so we're doing this. Oh my gosh, it was so awful. I can still, I feel, still feel sick about it. It's, we spent the rest of our evening trying to get these like marks out of the carpet and like wringing it because we only had two towels and two flannels, wringing them out and then trying to do it. And we had the heater on and the hair dryer. And I got the job. I don't know why I got the job. I had to take, we couldn't sleep in the duvet because we tried getting the wine out of the. Out of the duvet as well. So I had to take the duvet downstairs <laughs> and say, I'm really sorry, but we spit. It was luckily the cleaner, not the couple. And she was like, quite like, it's okay, it's okay, I'll try and figure it out. Um, but anyway, that's just like this awful memory. The night was ruined. We spent the rest of the night trying to like get stuff out and praying and crying. And I like was hysterical. I'd cry and then like, no, it's okay, we've got this and try and be humorous about it. But anyway, um, what comes out of the coffee cup when it's knocked? Coffee. I've got this really awesome, um, I don't know if you know what a meme means, but anyway, on Facebook, these things come up, these quotes and things. I love this analogy. You are holding a cup of coffee when someone comes along and bumps into you or shakes you shakes your arm, making you spill your coffee everywhere. Why did you spill the coffee? Well, because someone bumped into me, of course. Wrong answer. You spilled the coffee because there was coffee in your cup. Had there been tea in your cup, you would have spilled tea. Whatever is inside the cup is what will spill out. And I think this is such a powerful image for us in our lives. When we get knocked, when the pressure's on, what comes out of our mouth? What look comes out onto our face? And, you know, sometimes as humans, we, we might blurt something out or say something that we regret and we say, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm not the kind of person that says that or does that. Well, actually, yes, you are because you just did. Do you see what I'm saying? We've got um, this character, Jonah. And I want us to look at what comes out of the cup of this man when he's knocked. Last week, we had Michelle take us a bit through the narrative of Jonah, and she landed on the fact that God is a merciful God, that God gives good things to those of us, to all of us, even when we don't deserve it. But I want to look at this character of Jonah, because it's fascinating what goes on. Jonah is asked by God to go to Nineveh. 
Literally, there's that one sentence in the beginning of John, Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for the wickedness has come, before, um, has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish. That's the response. And he like, he, Jonah is so intentional and so intent on fleeing from God. <clears throat> His first response when he hears from God is to flee, yeah? And he goes to these extents, he gets on the ship, he pays money, he's asleep during the storm, and when they're casting lots on the ship, um, Jonah's like, I'm the reason for this storm, I'm sorry, just throw me overboard. Like, this is intense. Like, he obviously knows that God is God because he's heard from God, and he's fleeing from God to the extent that he's willing to jump over the ship. But what's really, really fascinating is this slow, it's almost like the slow motion watching the wine come out of the cup, waiting to see where the wine lands. Because this fish comes along. Jonah gets swallowed up by the fish. And then three days later, it's like Dory speaking whale. And funny, sorry, and joke if you know a movie. Sorry. Anyway, three days later, out comes the psalm of thanksgiving. Isn't that bizarre? It's taken a really, really, really long time for us to see the outcome of this cup being knocked. But what comes out is phenomenal. It is this phenomenal psalm of thanksgiving. And do you know what I find really, really fascinating when I was looking into this? Is that this psalm of thanksgiving that Mary read out, read out to us from Jonah chapter 2 is a combination of verses from nine other psalms that King David wrote. How does somebody pour out a psalm of thanksgiving that is pretty much a combination of scripture? How does someone do that? either an amazing miracle or he had memorized scripture. He had spent time with the Lord. Now, the reason I find this fascinating is because I can really relate to this. I think for all of us, 2020 has been a bit carnage. And in New Zealand, we're, 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 we give thanks for how, um, you know, it's, been much nicer for us than in other parts of the world. I get that. But it has still been carnage. And we are in the midst of a pandemic. And that has ruffled, that has knocked our cups all over the shop. And I can't tell you, I mean, it's it's affected us all in different ways. For me, there's been the intensity of starting this new role of leadership and having our third baby and living in community and lockdown. I've had a lot of moments of negative thought spirals and feeling a bit like Jonah, to be honest, and that it's taken me three days or more to give thanks and to connect back in with God because I've, I've, I've just, because of, I don't know, because I'm this 3D person that's not straightforward, it's taken me three days sometimes to get to that place of thanksgiving. Because actually the anxiety and my decisions and my, and my tiredness, I'm not excusing it, I'm just saying it as it is, and my, and my tiredness and my sleepless nights, I have chosen to go down the negative thought spirals. And when I'm sitting breastfeeding, which takes up a lot of the hours of my day, I get my phone and I'm often flicking through Facebook. Now there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself, but that's what I'm filling my mind with. Random articles about random things, some of them are, you know, interesting. Comparing my life to other people's things. That's what I'm filling my mind with. And I've been convicted recently. Like, imagine if I was sitting there in those moments, reading scripture or listening to worship music and filling my mind with those things. So that when I hear God calling me into something, I don't flee to the extreme of going to the complete opposite of what he's asking me to do. And it doesn't take me this exhausting three days or more to actually get back to that place of intimacy with Jesus. What is it that we are cultivating in our hearts? 
And we do see this beautiful thing that with Jonah, even though he intentionally flees from God, there is actually deep inside, when you pull back the layers, there is some cultivation there that has happened between him and God. What is it that we are cultivating and treasuring in our hearts? What comes out when we're bumped? What comes out of the coffee cup? I want to read the rest of that meme that I was reading at the beginning. Oh, yeah, and I'll say that in a minute. So, I read the meme, whatever is inside the cup is what will spill out. It then goes on to say this. Therefore, when life comes along and shakes you, which will happen? Whatever is inside you will come out. It's easy to fake it, isn't it? Until you get rattled. So we have to ask ourselves, What's in my cup? When life gets tough, what spills over? Joy, gratefulness, peace and humility? Or anger, bitterness, harsh words and a lack of patience? You choose. Today, let's work towards filling our cups with gratitude, forgiveness, joy, words of affirmation, and kindness, gentleness, and love for others. Isn't that beautiful? When we think about those things, when we cultivate those things in our hearts and the depths of who we are, when we get knocked, the hope is that will come out naturally. Like this, over, I had this image this morning when we were praying before the service of the, you know, the wellspring of life bubbling up within us and out of us, that it's just bubbling all the time up and out of us. It doesn't take us three days to get to the point of maybe being able to, yep, I can be patient with Phoebe. Do you see what I'm saying? When we were singing Reckless Love, which I think is a phenomenal song, I, in, the, in the bit where we're singing, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. I had this little other phrase I wanted to to add to it. There's no fish he won't send after you. He recklessly loves us. And this is not, um, I'm not condemning what comes out of your cups. I'm just helping us examine and look at it. Jesus doesn't condemn us. He comes after us with a fish. He's so desperate for us. He's so desperate for relationship with us. He's coming after us. His love for us is reckless. My question this morning to us is what is our response to that? What are we treasuring in our hearts? Mark and Kirsty Johnson are a beautiful couple who live down in Newtown in Wellington. And if you came on the 1030 um, church camp last year, they were the speakers at it. And Mark will actually be preaching here on Jonah chapter 3 next week and is leading a discipleship school here in Monganui. But Caleb and I are so inspired by this couple because their phrase for life, their kind of their tag phrase for life is daily reorientate your life around Jesus. Daily reorientate your life around Jesus. That's the call. That's, as, my, as Phoebe says, it's so cute, she says, that's the gig, mummy. That's the gig. Reorientate your life around Jesus every single day. The best decision is always to choose him, no matter what might have bumped your cup. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you for this phenomenal story of Jonah. We thank you for all the different layers that it speaks to us in our humanity and who you are and who we are in relationship to you, that you are the creator of the universe and you recklessly love each and every one of us at the same time. We are astounded by that truth this morning. Jesus, please help us not to be a distracted people. Please, Jesus, give us the courage and the strength to keep treasuring you, to daily reorientate our lives around Jesus. 
Jesus, we are sorry when we don't think on you. Fill us afresh today. That that wellspring of life would be bubbling up in us. Come, Holy Spirit, come and do that work in us now. Come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, welcome. You are welcome here. Guide us, Holy Spirit. Speak to us again. Why do I tapu? More of you, Lord Jesus. We bless your name in this space, for you are Lord and you are good. Amen. I'm now going to um, pass over to Lee, who's going to lead us in a time of communion.